Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to wait for the people joining us to take their seats. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And welcome to the LSE for today's hybrid event, which forms part of the LSE Festival, People and Change, which is taking place from Monday, the 12th of June, to Saturday, the 17th. <clears throat> And today's festival, the theme is exploring how does change affect people and how do people affect change. My name is Armina Ishkanian and I am, until August, an Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy and the Executive Director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program based at the International Inequalities Institute. I am very pleased to be here to welcome Dr. Rotel Nijayperli, Dr. Kristen Surak and Dr. Eleanor Knott, to both our online audience and to our audience here in the room. Robtel Nijai Kaili is Assistant Professor in International Social and Public Policy in the Department of Social Policy at the LSE, a Liberian scholar activist working at the intersection of critical African studies, critical development studies, and critical race studies. She centers her research on how structural transformation is conceived and contested by local, national, and transnational actors from crisis-affected regions of the so-called Global South. Her first monograph, titled Development, Dual Citizenship, and Its Discontents in Africa, The Political Economy of Belonging to Liberia, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, and it won the 2022 African Politics Conference Group Best Book Award, and contributed to the passage of Liberia's dual citizenship law. Welcome, Rob, thank you. <laughs> Kristen Surak is Associate Professor of Political Sociology in the Department of Sociology here at LSE. Her research on golden passports, international migration, nationalism, and politics has been translated into half a dozen languages. In addition to publishing in major academic and in major academic and intellectual journals. She also writes regularly for popular outlets, including the London Review of Books, the Washington Post, the Guardian, New Statesman, and the New Left Review. She has been a Richard B. Fisher member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Funk Global Fellow at Princeton University, and a Fellow of Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge. Her latest book, Citizenship for Sale, how the Wealthy by Global Mobility will be published by Harvard University Press in September 23. Welcome, Kristen. And last but not least is Dr. Eleanor Knott, who is a political scientist and assistant professor in qualitative methodology in the Department of Methodology at LSE. Her current research interests include the politics of identity and citizenship, predominantly in the post-Soviet space and qualitative research methods, primarily ethics and research. She has published in Perspectives on Politics, Qualitative Research, Journal of Ethic and Migration Studies, Citizenship Studies, and Democratization, among others. Her first book, Kin Majorities, Identity and Citizenship in Crimea and Moldova, was published by McGill University Press in 2022. So today our speakers, We'll be exploring the very complex and global nature of inequality. I forgot to say, welcome, Ellie. <laughs> <coughs> Drawing on their newly released books. Do we have that image up there? No. There we go. So you can see the beautiful front covers. Drawing on their newly released books, our panel will discuss new transformations in citizenship and inequality ranging from contestations around dual citizenship in Liberia, to the sale of citizenship by microstates to millionaires, to the extraterritorial acquisition of citizenship in Crimea and Moldova. For those of you who use Twitter in the audience, the hashtags for today's event is hashtag LSE Festival, all one word. I would please ask you to put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. And please note that this event is being recorded and we will hopefully be uh, making this available as a podcast 
subject to no technical difficulties. <laughs> so I'm going to explain the event format. So instead of having three presentations, um, we decided uh, as a group that we would actually, I would pose three questions to our speakers who would um, answer in turn, have a little bit of a discussion amongst themselves, and then around the 1.30 mark, I would open it up to the floor for Q&A to both our online audience and to the audience in the room. For our online audience, you can submit your questions via the Q&A function. Please include your name and affiliation. For those of you here in the theater, I will let you know when the floor is open. Please raise your hands and one of the stewards will bring one of the microphones to you. And again, if you could kindly let us know your name and affiliation, that would be greatly appreciated. I will try to ensure a range of questions from both our online and in-person audiences here in the theater today. So without further ado, I'm going to begin. So, first question. <laughs> Citizens experience the institution of citizenship differently regardless of their legal status as citizens. In what ways would you say that your respective books demonstrate that citizenship is differentiated by class, race, ethnicity, and gender, and so forth? So, Rob, tell. Thank you for the question, Marvina. We knew what the questions were before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to give you a quick kind of broad-based spiel about my book. So my book is a book that looks at contestations around dual citizenship in Liberia. And I use a contested dual citizenship bill that was introduced in Liberia in 2008, but never passed. It lingered in legislative window for about 10 years. Really to ask broader questions about what does it mean to be a citizen in a post-war context, and what kinds of implications might that have for membership, belonging, so forth and so on. And then also for processes of socio-political economic development. So in terms of how Liberian citizenship specifically is differentiated by race, class, gender, ethnicity, so forth and so on, I'll just give, come up with two examples because it's differentiated by all of the above. But the most interesting examples of the differentiation is, so Liberia was Africa's first black republic. It was established in 1847. And the vast majority of people who traveled to Liberia were migrants, black migrants from the United States, from the Caribbean, from the Congo River Basin. But of course, as is the case of human history, when people arrive at a particular locale, there are usually people already there. And there were certain people, certainly people already there, indigenous populations who occupied the, the hinterland as well as the coast. But what these black migrant settlers did, because they were fleeing economic servitude, some of them, as well as racial injustices in these places that they had fled, they embedded in Liberia's constitution something called a, a Negro clause. And the Negro clause effectively states that only people of Negro descent are allowed to have citizenship, whether by birth, ancestry, or nationalization. Now, that particular clause has endured. Almost 200 years later, it still exists. So as you can probably tell, citizenship is certainly differentiated by race in Liberia. It definitely affects those who are obviously not of Negro descent. So increasingly, large populations of Indian nationals, Lebanese nationals, and other South, um, South Asian nationals. So that's how Liberian citizenship is differentiated by race. In terms of class, what the black migrant settlers also embedded in the citizenship laws is that citizenship and land ownership are inextricably tied. So the reason they established a Negro clause as well as this rule around citizenship and um, land ownership being inextricably tied is they wanted to be the sole owners of the means of production. And land, obviously, is an example of that, right? So when the, when the citizenship laws were established in Liberia in 1847, those indigenous populations who lived on the hinterland as well as on the coast were barred from citizenship for the first 100 years of the um, establishment of the nation state. And because they were barred from citizenship, they couldn't own land. So, citizen, so land ownership became um, a criteria, a criterion for citizenship in the same way that race or blackness became a criteria for citizenship. So that's how citizenship in Liberia is differentiated by race as well as by class. Oh, thank you. Kristen. Okay, so, so I'm looking at a very different context. Basically, you know, small countries that sell citizenship to very wealthy people. 
Um, and I look at in, in the book, which is coming out in September, it actually has a new title, gold, you know, there's a politics of titles too, it's the Golden Passport, Global Mobility for Millionaires, it's coming out with Harvard, you can pre-order it on the Amazon if you're interested in this stuff further. And I look at kind of, you know, how this market works, what does it mean when citizenship becomes a commodity? It's not an easy thing to commodify, because the only producer of it, the state, is also the rule maker of the market. And so I talk about what that means to build a mark around citizenship. And I talk about the politics around it too, because we usually think about citizenship in terms of the rights we get within a country, whereas citizenship by investment, citizenship as a commodity is about the rights that your citizenship gets you outside of your country. And that means that there's a big geopolitics to it because the value is not controlled by you, the value is controlled by third countries, which, was, with which you have um, treaties. And then, then I talk about the economics, you know, what. Who, you know, how the whole citizenship industry that's making money off of this works, what this means for the countries that are doing it. Some places up like 30% of GDP, 50% of GDP. The country would have a hard time economically if these programs were canceled. Also talk about what locals think and, you know, the, and as well as why people go for this um, as well. You know, what is demand? You can hear, you know, you might get this a little bit on the, you know, the newspaper, whatever the news, and you just think it's all, you know, criminals and oligarchs and tax evaders. And the story is really not that at all, for the most part. You get the usual case of that, but it's it's much more complicated. So thinking about then how citizenship is differentiated in these cases. Gender, there's a little bit of a story, but the main thing is you know, gonna be obviously here, a little bit of little bit of race as well, but definitely class. And the way that works with, with global inequalities, because you know, if you think about you know, a lot of people who have quote unquote privileged passports. Um, you know, if you, you you know if you're from the UK, if you're from the US, if you come from a European country, you know Canada, whatever. Um, you don't think about what how hard it is to travel. <laughs> you don't think you know you don't think about parking your passport in embassies over and over to do this. You don't think about the different rights you have, the different possibilities, and all that. Um, but but there's a great inequality in between citizenships across the world. So there's this intra-country inequality in citizenships, which as which is why a lot of people go for it because they just can't get the visas to travel. They just don't know what their home government is going to do next. Um, they just don't have the same business opportunities as others. Citizenship is often very linked with business opportunities. And they don't have you know, the same lifestyle options mm -hmm. as well. Those are, those are the four main reasons of, of demand that I found. Um, but so it's in, um, inequalities in between countries, but obviously in, within countries as well. Because you know, the, the cost of these programs ranges anywhere from about 100,000 US dollars upwards of, you know, north of like a, about a million or so at, at this point in time. And so, you know, it's never, you got to have the money to do this. And depending on what your situation is, you know, that can be easier or harder um, to, to get um, as well. And then the final thing to, to think about in terms of this is, is the, you know, the, the race dimension too. Because it's typically people from, historically, it's been people from the global south with quote unquote bad passports who've gone for these programs. And so you see this also intricately inter intertwined with um, debates around race. Um, and a lot of the, the debates in, in Europe are, are North Atlantic focused. Sorry. Is that, is that, was that, that was a wrap it up kind of thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. So my book is also very different, but in a way is existing in the, the same world um, as, as both these books and, and the kind of um, intersections of the kind of privileged international system of passports that we exist in. So I look at the intersections of identity and citizenship for ordinary people um, in Moldova and Crimea, and I look at how and why they might engage with um, acquiring, uh, kind of practicing external citizenship. So in Moldova, I look at Romanian citizenship and the acquisition or reacquisition of Romanian citizenship, and in Crimea, I look at um, engagement with Russia through citizenship and compassion policy. The short story being, remain uh, in Moldova, huge amounts of engagement um, since about 1998. About a third of Mold Moldovans have acquired Romanian citizenship, um, so like a million people. Um, and meanwhile in Crimea, prior to annexation, a lot of people presumed that Russian citizenship was very prevalent in, in Crimea, very um, kind of possible, accessible, legitimate, and I actually say, surprisingly, we don't, I, I, I do not observe that much Western uh, citizenship engagement um, in Crimea. So what is the kind of story about inequality? I mean, I think, so interestingly, Romania has often legitimized itself uh, in, in kind of facilitating policies of, of um, acquisition of citizenship for non-residents in Moldova because it's not doing what the Nauta states like Malta are doing in selling citizenship. 
we have, um, you know, the right people in Moldova deserve uh, Romanian citizenship if they're eligible for it. They, they, you know, they have this ultimate kind of need and uh, right for it. Whereas naughty uh, Moldova, um, sorry, naughty Malta is selling citizenship. The EU should be way more concerned about that. Um, and and kind of the differentiation also by ethnicity. So Romania kind of sells its policy as it has nothing to do with ethnicity whatsoever. It's about territorial rights. So Moldova was part of or was annexed by uh, Romania in the interwar period. Um, and access to citizenship, access to Romanian citizenship, is very much about demonstrating you have um, uh, antecedents, gra uh, grandparents, great-grandparents, or parents that were born in the, the interwar period. Um, but it ends up being a largely ethnic policy. So on the one hand, it's kind of how Moldovans exist in the world where they have access to these rights, but they also don't really have access to other rights <coughs> before visa liberalisation comes um, in 2014. So in a system where you didn't need to travel to Romania uh, with a passport or with a visa before Romania was uh, joining the EU, suddenly things totally shift around and you need 500 euros in a bank account to, to get a visa. Incredibly, expens uh, like incredibly expensive and impossible. And so what looks like a very dehumanizing visa regime has this option of kind of alternative stability through citizenship by saying like, I don't have to fight for these rights, I can just kind of gain access to the world um, through that way and kind of look at then how and why Romanian citizenship um, is practiced. And I'll end there. Although I don't have to, but <laughs> keep time. Thank you. Thank you all three for I have questions that I'm going to hold up on that. Um, so the second question, and we'll start off with Kristen on, on the second question, is how does the differentiated nature of citizenship produce or reproduce inequalities in the cases you explore? Was there anything that surprised you about your findings? Oh, I should have thought about these questions. I, I was stuck on a train coming over from Oxford <laughs> this morning. Um, well, I, I addressed some of those um, just now in terms of the inequalities between between countries and what citizenship gets you, but um, and which is which is which covers demand. And there's some interesting wrinkles in that as well. So some of it might be considered compensatory citizenship, and people have, have written about that. But there's but that's not the whole story. There's also, for example, since COVID nineteen, been a huge boom in um, U.S. citizens applying to these programs because suddenly they realize that on their privileged, um, you know, whatever blue passport with a golden eagle on the front, they couldn't go to Europe whenever they wanted. You know, they, they suddenly had those possibilities taken away. And so it becomes a future hedge um, for a lot of people as well. So it can be, you know, compensating for rights that one doesn't have, but it can also just simply be multiplying opportunities. And for very wealthy people, that thing, risk averse, multiplying opportunities, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E is, is a really big thing. But also then thinking about sort of inequalities, what I hinted at before in terms of the value of the citizenship that's secured by third countries, it's visa-free access to the European Union, it's um, you know, possibly, you know, just better visa-free access to other countries, it's business possibilities in terms of cheaper import taxes, it's applying for an E2 treaty trader visa so that you can live in the US because you're a citizen of Grenada or Turkey. Um, you know, all, all of those possibilities mean that there's a geopolitics to it. And so what I found in my research, you get a lot of barking from the European Union, or the, meaning the European Parliament and the European Commission, but it's the US that controls the game. The US is a very, very powerful figure behind all of this. Um, and the US does that through the control of, of US dollar flows, corresponding banking, could shut down these countries very quickly if it wanted to, gum up their economic systems. And it does through knowing what people are, which people are going through, and it does through pressuring countries in terms of who they can let in or not. So for example, Russian citizens, U.S. will still um, issue a visa if you're a Russian citizen. You can travel there, or they'll let you, whatever. But you, none of these countries will, well, none, none of the key countries, the microstates, will naturalize you through their programs because of U.S. pressure. Turkey will, but none of the Caribbean countries will. Malta won't either. So you see U.S. foreign policy is imposing itself on the naturalization policies of other small countries that are highly dependent on this. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Ellie. Um, so I'm going to maybe answer the question in two ways, which is to take the, the second aspect, what surprised I mean, a lot of things surprised me, but the thing that I would kind of think might be most interesting is the way in which I challenged my own assumptions about Crimea as a place which, if you read about in other works, you think it was super pro-Russian, everyone was a Russian citizen, and 
And when annexation comes in 2014, they're like, great, this is what we've been waiting for. And my book is like, hold on, that is not the case, as far as I can see. Um, that Russia, for many people, was not seen as a good actor, that status quo, as in Crimea remaining and, and being a, a part of uh, Ukraine without war and conflict and violence was absolutely what people supported and that Russian identity was much more complex than we often give it credit for. And Russian citizenship was, for most people, undesirable, illegitimate, unnecessary for their lives. And so I kind of say, like, you think you know what Crimea looked like before Russia annexed it. I think we have to really kind of challenge those assumptions and look beyond certain actors and certain interests and kind of what they're trying to project about what Crimea, look, Crimea looks like, looked like, and actually kind of, if you look at ordinary people, it's much more complex and much more contested, and we never kind of hear from those perspectives. On the kind of inequality aspect, um, I think it's that, in, in one sense, gaining rights to citizenship is uh, reducing inequality in the kind of global system. But, but because it's ethnicized, it's kind of also demonstrating inequality as well. And because it's about Moldovans being peripheralized as a result of Europeanization, that's a kind of simplistic uh, take on it, but let's go with that. Um, it's about what you, trying to find ways to exist in a world that is increasingly making kind of your life and access to the world difficult and expensive. And I think the other thing that I try to challenge in the book, and I'll say this very quickly, is the idea that Romania is giving out passports. That is totally not an accurate reflection on the amount of time, resources, as a family, people have to make to go through the process of Romanian citizenship acquisition. You have to go to the archives, in particular if your um, parents, grandparents, ancestors were deported by the Soviet Union, you don't have the documents necessary to demonstrate. You have to find those documents, you have to get them translated, transliterated, you have to wait a huge amount of time. So all of the kind of right-wing press that um, was around, you know, with her opening up a route um, to the UK from Moldova, probably 10 years ago now, was like, you know, Romania's giving out golden passports, and that just simply is not the case. Like, there's a huge amount of kind of um, personal investment and contingency and uncertainty in that as well. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so one of the things that I talk about in the book is this idea of the contestation around dual citizenship really revealing both domestic anxieties around the prospects of what dual citizenship might portend, and then also what I call diasporic aspirations. So I'm really into alliteration, domestic mm -hmm. anxiety versus diasporic <laughs> aspirations. And when I talk about domestic anxieties, what I'm really talking about is those Liberians primarily in the country. So I interviewed about 200 plus Liberians in five different cities, five different countries, three different continents. If you want to hear more about that, I can tell you about the methodology. But the vast majority of people who are staunchly opposed to Liberian citizenship being de um, liberalized in terms of dual citizenship enactment were those who were primarily based in the country, many of whom had never left the country, either before, during, or after the war. And they effectively saw dual citizenship as a zero-sum game, mm -hmm. as infringing upon their already very limited access to political, economic, and social rights as perhaps even privileging a seemingly privileged class of transnational actors, whether that's true or not, and as reproducing inequalities. Then I spoke to a lot of the diasporic Liberians, and they saw dual citizenship quite differently. They saw it as entrenching their already very important contributions to political, economic, and social transformation of the country. So you already see that dichotomy, dichotomy between the domestic anxieties and the diasporic aspirations for dual citizenship. Now what surprised me about the research as a Liberian citizen someone who has never naturalized and has no intention of naturalizing in the UK, U the US, the country that I've had most experiences, is that a lot of my interlocutors also, many of them who did naturalize, held on to their Liberian citizenship for 15, 20, 30 years, even after they were eligible. So this idea that Global South, so-called Global South nationals are clamoring, clamoring, clamoring for Global North citizenships, for me, is the complete farce. Right? So not only did a lot of my interlocutors never naturalize, like I never naturalized, I had no intention of naturalizing, but those who did naturalize did so because there was a protracted armed conflict in Liberia. And many of them felt very conflicted about it because they knew that, for instance, they couldn't vote in the United States, but they couldn't vote in Liberia because it was a war raging. And after 10, 15, 20, 30 years, then they eventually naturalized. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a sort of deep, deeply ingrained metaphysical connection to Liberia that transcends the practicality of having a Golden North passport. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Really interesting. So our third and final. Uh, oh, actually, before we move on, do you want to reflect on each other for? Um... I, I would say I, I don't, I'm not sure if I would consider these global. I don't know if you're talking about myself, but I don't know if the, these are global most passports beyond Malta. No, I'm not talking about okay. you. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so the, the gotcha. interviewees in that terms I spoke of the, to, yeah, gotcha. so there were interviewees in the United States as well as the UK. So I consider those two countries global. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That that is interesting, um, because I remember reading some research that was saying that um, arguing that you know often. People with, you know, quote-unquote, very privileged passports tend to naturalize because of sentimental reasons. But if you're lower down in terms of, you know, kind of socioeconomic hierarchies in the you know, global system, that people become more strategic. And it's interesting that in your case, you're finding that, you know, people are, you know, sort of securely in a place, kind of like, but is that because that was after dual citizenship was allowed? No, so dual okay. citizenship was only passed in July 2022. So this is a very recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So these, okay. these nationals were in the US, UK for 15, 20, 50, 30 years, and they refused to naturalize. Liberia now has dual citizenship. Yes, and okay. as of last July. But my book was written before then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I just think it's super interesting to reflect on, on Robert, like um, dual citizenship as a zero-sum game, because I, I, in Moldova, it, it really isn't. Mm. And I think, so anyway, but I, I wonder if that is because of the kind of institutional binary choice, like the, the kind of setup, because in Moldova, well, I think in general, like we've often assumed that acquiring citizenship from one place mm -hmm. necessarily says anything about your affiliation or loyalty or identity with the original citizenship that you might have. And so I also tried to kind of contest that. I also contest the symbolic versus strategic, like it's a, a single dimension and say like in Moldova, yeah, sure, those two things are going on. There's material rights and identity, but there's also like the legitimacy of these rights and kind of seeing them as normal and natural. Anyway, so I'm just kind of wondering if the institutional setup then also affects kind of what we see. Like if people don't see that, don't have that as a binary choice, then it allows them more kind of flexibility and freedom. I mean, one of the things I explore, Ellie, it's a good question. One of the things I explore in the book is, is, is this sort of contestation around dual citizenship unique to Liberia given its migratory history? And the fact that for the first 100 years of the mm -hmm. existence of the nation state, these indigenous populations were far from citizenship. So I take a very historical view to say, everything that's happening now, or I guess two years ago, in terms of contestations around dual citizenship, they, they don't exist in a vacuum. Like there's a historical context here that we have to take into consideration given that the country is a migratory country. Um, so when I spoke to those homelanders, the people that I deemed homelanders, a lot of them said, one of the, the concerns I have is if these dual nationals become dual nationals, they will come back and be able to claim land, yeah. right? Much of the squatter population of Monrovia, Liberia's capital city, do not have entitlements to the land that they currently squat on. And a lot of these land plots are owned by Liberians who live abroad. So what I talk about now is dual citizenship 2.0. Now that the law has been passed, what kinds of inequalities will it actually produce? Mm -hmm. And land is a powder peg in Liberia. It's a powder peg and it's also a conflict generating issue for the country. So it's, it's one of the ways that I, I sort of explain those issues. This is where I wish we had more time to tell <laughs> me, but I'm... Um, mindful that you know we also want to bring in the audience. I'm going to ask the final question, and Ellie will begin with you. Is citizenship is as much about exclusion as it is about inclusion? How do we fashion more inclusive citizenship regimes at national, regional, and global levels? So I already knew I was going to get to answer this question first, and I was like, it's it's a big one, and also the solution could be like quite. Um, not revolutionary, like mm -hmm. anarchic, which, uh, so I think there are minimalist and maximalist ways to do this. And I, I see this, in, in a way, the way that I answer this is not so much about my research, but more about being a system for the UK. Make citizenship easier to acquire. Naturalization. Mm -hmm. uh, lower the cost of citizenship. Get rid of citizenship tests. Make it, um, uh, because we could say abolish citizenship because it's creating these inequalities. Mm -hmm. But I think with citizenship as a legal status, that is the kind of gateway to accessing rights. Citizenship is actually incredibly important as a kind of function of those rights, yeah. like voting. Um, and to get to, to argue to get rid of citizenship is to kind of not necessarily understand its role, but we shouldn't be making it so hard. And we shouldn't be kind of making people uh, jump through hoops financially 
socially, intellectually, in order to prove that they're somehow worthy as a consequence of being here for a really long time and being a taxpayer member of society. I, I mean, even with children, the amount of money that the UK government makes out of the cost of uh, naturalisation for children is abhorrent. Um, but I would say maybe abolish borders would be the more controversial, not le less controversial, but like, I don't, I don't, I don't see them as a good actor. Like citizenship should be about facilitating, facilitating rights, but, but borders are, like the securitization of borders is causing so much harm um, that that would be my kind of more okay. take on what should happen. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the ways that this might be resolved in terms of increasing or um, inequalities around citizenship is in terms of national adoption of Jusalee citizenship automatically. So this is birthright citizenship. And I think the US, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, the US is the only country that has automatic all, of, others, all of the Americas. Okay. So all, all the Americas America. birthright citizenship. I think that's one of the ways to democratize citizenship. If you were born in a particular locale, you should be entitled to citizenship. The UK doesn't allow from what I remember birthright citizenship. In terms of maybe global or geopolitical, I think one of the things that we need to be very careful about is statelessness. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Liberia, I talked to you about the Negro Clause. So the Negro Clause has created a large population of stateless people. Those who have mixed race, maybe their father is Lebanese or their father is Indian, and their mother is Liberian. For a long time, Liberia didn't allow um, women to pass on citizenship to their children born abroad. So you've got large populations of mixed race Liberians who have a non-Negro father who are not entitled to Liberian citizenship by birth. And I think that that is absolutely, absolutely problematic. Um, so this jus solely kind of across the board entitlement would, it, would, would maybe decrease the levels of statelessness um, across the board. And then also prohibiting states from being able to strip people of their citizenship because maybe they participate in so-called terrorist tax, uh, um, uh, terrorist, um, or allegedly uh, participate in terrorist tax, uh, tax abroad. Um, so I think making sure that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has citizenship entitlement as one of the, the entitlements of, of like a human right. Citizenship should be a human right in that particular instance. Thanks, Rob Tell. Um, yeah, so thinking about this question, I suppose in the first instance, because I'm a political sociologist, it's kind of like, well, you know, states are strategic. You know, first of all, I was reading, I was thinking, who is this we who's going to go around and change citizenship? Wow, you know, that's like one of these wonderful ivory tower and save the world kind of things. And I tend to be really cynical about this stuff. You know, so, um, so states are strategic about citizenship. And you see this in a lot of policies, and they tend to be more generous to population. You know, if you think about, you know, giving, giving citizenship to diaspora populations, it tends to be ones in wealthy countries or powerful countries that have better access. You, South Korea is a great case of that, where it had, you know, first in, in terms of residence and in citizenship, it was like, you know, not, it wasn't the Koreans in, um, you know, people of Korean descent in China left over from Japanese imperial expansion. It was, you know, Koreans in the U.S. who were a lot of um, business owners that they were, you know, being more generous to. So you see states being very strategic of, at this, at a, you know, in, in many ways. It's interesting in th thinking about the regional level, because, when, you know, everybody knows the EU, you know, um, but, you know, being a, a citizen of a EU member state is like being a citizen of 26 countries. But it's also true in a lot of other places. So ECOWAS has similar exchange of rights, CARICOM in the Caribbean, Mercosur has this to a different degree. So we also see more regional integration of citizenship. So that thing where you can move to another country and you have very close to, not exactly the same, but very similar rights as, as citizens of that country. But at the world level, I don't think it's ever going to happen. And the, you know, it goes to this, you know, you want to think about no borders, and you know, there have been a lot of good academic debates around that. Um, but because if you look at nation states, nation and state, the people I'm looking at, you know, it's all about the state. It's not about the nation. It's you know, membership in the state and access to the legal protections of that, not not part of the identity things. And whereas that's coming up much more strongly in in your work, in, in the work that you guys are doing in very interesting, complex ways. Um, but, but nation states are also a fundamental capitalism because they secure jurisdictions and legal rights for capitalism to operate. States also get their power from embracing populations, inclusionary and exclusionary as well. And as long as nation states remain a fundament of global capitalism, which needs some sort of legal securing of their things, and they also are gaining power by embracing and excluding populations, we're not going to see any kind of global citizenship um, emerge anytime soon. It means there's going to be a continuing inequalities between citizenship, even if we see more regional integration and interchangeability of, of, of these um, stat legal statuses. In my case, it's very much a legal status. The identity side is much less. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. So I'm looking at the time. We have about 25 minutes till the end of the event. I'm going to give you guys just a chance to respond to one another, and then I'll turn to the Q&A. Yeah, I think since one of our regional integration is really important. Um, so I studied Liberia, which is in ECOWAS, the Economic Community in West African States. And what I discovered through my research is that Liberia was heavily influenced by the sort of transnational tide happening in ECOWAS. Before Liberia passed its dual citizenship bill, it was the only country in ECOWAS that prohibited dual citizenship. And when I spoke to a lot of policymakers, particularly in the legislature, the four sponsors of the dual citizenship bill said to me, we spoke to parliamentarians in Sierra Leone, we spoke to parliamentarians in Ghana, and we realized that we were an outlier. And that wasn't sufficient, given that we were the first black African republic. And the fact that we have a migratory history, we can't prohibit people who left through no fault of their own, through war. Um, we can't prohibit them from, from obtaining citizenship. So you do see the sort of influence coming from um, sort of a tie to, to harmonize regional citizenship laws influencing states um, as much as might happen at the geopolitical level. I, I mean, I just wanted to, yeah, I think shining a light on statelessness is really important. Again, putting my angry UK system hat back on. Like, this is something that we're increasingly seeing. And to kind of go back to that strategic angle on states, I mean, I guess in a, in a one way, it seems like a very insular kind of strategic measure to do so, but then statelessness is, is both the revocation of rights, but also leaving people in this kind of limbo, no man's land, where no state is really able to necessarily do anything about. So, like, so I don't really understand why the UK is going through this kind of statelessness turn, let's say. Um, and I, I think maybe it comes back to me seeing also cynically, states as kind of bureaucracies with weird, coercive, and often kind of inconsistent um, behavior. And the example I was going to give in Moldova, going back to actually the premise of the book, is like um, the state has power to, to revoke citizenship, but it also has power to restrict you wanting to renounce citizenship in kind of weird and interesting ways. So again, I think coming back to the like maybe also making it easier for people to give up citizenship if they want to. They don't want to have this kind of ties anymore, they should also be free to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying, I, maybe I'll just open it up to the audience. Okay, great. I, I did want to say something really quickly. I think one of the things that I discovered in my research is that initially when Liberia was established, there was an all powerful sort of, sort of hegemonic state that did have the rights to restrict and include people. But I found in my research that there, there actually is a lot of power coming from people. I mean, this, this whole LSE festival is about people and change, right? right? So I would argue that in the case of Liberia, it might be different in other contexts, that Liberians have had a fundamental impact on changing citizenship regimes in the country. So let's not forget about the power of people. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to add. It's a really good way of kind of <laughs> opening it up to the, to the people to ask questions. So Olivia, do we have a question online? Yes. So I'll take one question from online and then a uh, uh, second question. Uh, so the first uh, question is from Bharadraj Gaya, who is in Mumbai. Uh, and it's a question for all speakers. How do we make easy and diminish the timeline for the citizen process, uh, sorry, citizenship process in a country for refugees, but also keep in mind national security measures for a country? Okay, before you answer, let me take the question from the room as well, please. Yes, unless if Hi, my question is about Liberia and how do we define these policies as we have ethno states like China or Japan or even Israel where you need to be Jewish for you to emigrate and make Aliyah. How do we define Liberia? Because it sounds that it's a racist state. So I don't know if it's, I know, like, like a black Africa, <laughs> black, black Africa okay. state being racist. How do we define it? Provocative questions. Okay. So, um, I'll again do the same. So why don't you start, Rochelle, and sure. then next time we'll go. So you'll be interesting to know that I am writing a new book, and the book is called Africa's Negro Republics, and it hones in on this idea of the Negro clause. And there's a whole debate amongst policymakers, amongst citizens in Liberia as well as Sierra Leone, because Sierra Leone is one of the other countries that has a Negro clause, although it's more liberal than Liberia is. Mm -hmm. The question is, is this clause racist, or is it protectionist? And if it's protectionist, whose interests does it protect? One of our interlocutors said, the clause isn't racist, it's racialist. It's about racial pride, not necessarily about exclusion, right? And the history of Liberia also talks about the fact that these people were fleeing racist economic um, uh, you know, ill treatment. 
And so they established a clause on these sort of historical um, grounds. Um, but I am interested now in what kinds of implications it has for, again, these large populations of South Asian nationals particularly. The other thing that I try to do in the book, the new book, is to talk about the fact that the clause is also about challenging white supremacy. Like that's what the clause intended to do. And I think to a certain extent, it still intends to do that. So whether it's racist, protectionist, racialist, is an answer that I'm going to try to come up with in the new book. But you have to wait. Watch the space. I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. Did you also want to comment um, to the online question about yeah. balancing? I mean, they were asking specifically about refugees, incorporating refugees and enabling them to become citizens. Refugees are an interesting population of people because, because they're fleeing a well-founded fear and they end up in another country or they cross the border and they end up in another country. They're actually not entitled to citizenship of that particular country. So unless, uh, unless refugee status is revoked or um, runs out of time, in the case of Liberia, for instance, so after about 10, 15 years, Liberian refugee status was, was by UNHCR was, was overturned. Because as far as UNHCR was concerned, Liberia was stable enough for these refugees to return. But they did give them an opportunity to settle or resettle in the places that they eventually fled to. Or, and after settlement, then perhaps naturalization is the next step. So they're a bit tricky because it, by virtue of having refugee status, what it means is that you can't obtain citizenship or naturalization in a particular country that you flee to until that refugee status is no more. Thank you. I mean, it's slightly outside my expertise, but I guess I just come with this concern about primarily the securitization of refugees and the kind of assumption that they might be a Trojan horse or a fifth column that would be a kind of a concern or a threat to the state and society in which they're fleeing to. And, and then say, like, I don't understand why exclusion is a, a better way to address those concerns. I mean, like, I see these concerns as illegitimate, but also where exclusion is a better way to address them than inclusion. Like, I think inclusion is a better way to address those concerns and, and also hopefully for those just concerns to be questioned than, like, with statelessness, I think it's the same thing. Like, that these are not good solutions to these problems. They're worse solutions, but somehow they kind of come out of the fore as, like, the, the common sense way of doing it. It just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, briefly on refugees, one has to remember that most refugees in the world are in the country next door. They're, you know, from in difficult regions. Or, so most of them are in the global south. Turkey is the largest host of refugees. I think Colombia is, is maybe second because of, because of Venezuelans. You know, it's not, most refugees are not trying to get into Europe because Europe pays Turkey to keep people out. Um, and, and Turkey, by the way, is the largest seller of citizenship out of all the countries there, which is just kind of surprising. It's, it's a fairly, fairly new development on top of it. And so, you know, for a lot of people who are, you know, forced from their homes, and refugees are very politicized status. It means you've crossed an international border, and the UNHCR right now is trying to turn people into internationally displaced people, moving them to a safer part of the country where they are, and to, rather than making them um, refugees. So that status itself is highly politicized. And this question of naturalization, too, is not necessarily the biggest issue on their mind. You know, if you're in Dadaab, you know, camp in Kenya or, you know, whatever, that, you know, it's probably, you're not really thinking about the, that thing of, net, you know, so it, it's also kind of a Eurocentric kind of buy, or also kind of North Atlantic kind of bias. I'm thinking about this question of citizenship and naturalization as being the most pressing issue um, in these cases. Thank you. Do we have another question on mic? Uh, this is uh, submitted anonymously, um, but referring to the idea that citizenship is building the borders for the countries, and sometimes the borders will become barriers of communication among those countries. Could you share your opinion on that idea? Barriers of communication. Okay, I'm going to take another question. Um, in person. Um... Hi, thanks. I'm Tim Hildebrandt, the Department of Social Policy. Um, thanks, uh, all of you. It's um, really fascinating stuff. You've all reflected on citizenship as rights and privileges and accessing citizenship, but to what extent does your work uh, reflect on responsibilities of citizenship? Ellie, would you like to start? We have two questions. You can choose to answer both, or because I'm looking at time now. <laughs> um, I'll take the second question first. Um, in terms of responsibilities, um, I think the biggest way that it comes up 
is this kind of, but it's in a very specific context where Romanian citizenship was associated with the now kind of prior president Sescu. It was kind of fostering of a duty, like in a very well-crafted way, like Sescu is giving us citizenship, so we should vote for him. And that kind of circularity is a really interesting kind of like duty responsibility that seemed to come out um, of Romanian citizenship. So that's the main way. People would often ask about military service, and I would say that in the context in which I was doing the research, the field work was from 10 years ago, almost, yeah, 10 years ago now. You know, these were regions without conflict, violence, war, in them or nearby. That world is now entirely different. So we don't kind of know the answer to those questions of military responsibilities and duties. But um, yeah, I think that's also kind of something to, to note. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thinking about citizenship and duties and responsibilities in terms of the work that I, I kind of do, it's kind of like, there, there's not much there. But there's not much there in general. Okay, some countries have some military service and that, that can be an issue. But, you know, for the most, you know, we usually think of vote, you know, voting might be required, you know, be an Australian, if you're Australian, you're required to vote, that's a national duty. UK, you get jury duty, US, you get jury duty. But most of these are, you know, people have described this as citizenship light. These are lightning, they become less and less over time. Um, you know, so, um, you know, responsibilities as well, that almost seems to be more on the nation side of the hyphen, what is your duty to the community and all of that. But the stuff I'm doing, it's so, it's so instrumental that none of that really matters. And if, you know, in a lot, most countries, you know, if you don't vote and be a good citizen or whatever, you're not going to get kicked out. I haven't, you know, if I don't vote in a UK election, I'm not going to be denaturalized, you know, for that. And, but at the same time, a lot of the places where I'm looking at, citizenship is kind of a liability to people. If you're, um, you know, you maybe you fully identify, you know, love your family, love your homeland, or whatever. But if you're, you know, say a citizen of Pakistan, you can only go to about 35 countries visa-free. That's a big liability, um, you know. It, and you know, on top of it, it, you know, one of the interesting things that I look at is sometimes it's you get better rights being a foreigner at home. So if, for example, you're a, a Vietnamese business person investing in Vietnam and you don't know what the government's doing, you don't trust the courts, you can get more rights as, an, as a foreigner through bilateral investment treaties and international arbitration, protecting your assets as a business person. You know, so you might as well buy an off-the-shelf citizenship in Vanuatu and use that in order to protect the business you're trying to grow and develop. Um, so uh, yeah, and borders as barriers, I would say, yep, countryside to find populations, and you know, that's a source of power, it's a source of GDP, and yeah, they do it. They're not too concerned. They're not always too concerned about communication. Yeah, yeah Tim. I, if you're really interested in this, I would encourage you to read my book. I encourage all of you. But I'm saying this for a reason. There's a whole theoretical framework around that idea of responsibility. So when I spoke to my interlocutors, I basically came up with a theoretical framework called the Liberian Citizenship Triad. And on each note of the triad, you've got rights, responsibilities, and, and relationships. And one of the triad, one of the nodes in the triad is citizenship as identity, and that's largely passive. But there's a large node about citizenship as active, practice-based citizenship. And a lot of my interlocutors kept talking about this idea of citizenship being akin to contributions. So it's what you do with that identity that makes you a citizen, not because you wave, wave around a blue passport. One of my interlocutors even said, they're all blue nowadays, so they don't <laughs> matter, right? So it's what you do with that citizenship, how you practice that citizenship, the active form of citizenship. That's what makes you a citizen. And the subtitle of the book, The Political Economy of Belonging, is about that exchange. So socioeconomic transformation depends on the exchange of rights and responsibilities. So that idea of responsibilities came up heavily in my interviews with people across these different locales. Very interesting. It fits again with our festival theme of people and <laughs> change. Do we have another question? OK. Thank you. Uh, this is from Mercedes Masters, who is a member of staff here at LSE. It's a two-part question, if that's okay. Um, why do you think citizenship revocations and statelessness have remained widespread in the contemporary international system, first of all? And followed by, how can human rights scholars and policymakers address citizenship revocation and protect rights of individuals who have their citizenship deprived arbitrarily? Okay, thank you. Um, I had the individual right there in the yellow, and then I know your second, and then your third. Thank you very much. It's been a really interesting chat. Um, my question was just uh, focused on uh, something that you mentioned towards the end of the talk with regards to regional arrangements and I, I, I suppose this emergence of supranational uh, citizenship that we see in the EU and uh, a bit more in 
Mercosur as well. Um, I was curious whether this is really fundamentally changing how we see inequalities in citizenship, or if it's just redrawing where these boundaries are uh, from the nation state now to a regional level. Thank you. Mindful of time, I'm going to take one more question in the room, and then um, if you could give it to... Hi, I'm Kubilai Ochu. I'm a student here at the LSE in the Department of International Development. Um, my question is more for Kristen, I think. Uh, in your research, have you come across any political instrumentalization of naturalization in domestic politics uh, in these like s countries that sell their citizenship? Thank you. Um, so this time we're going to start with Kristen and then we'll tell another Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what you mean in terms of instrumentalization within domestic politics, so like turning it into an election issue or? Yeah, for instance, like in the case of Turkey in the past elections, like this year, the opposition was really critical of like Erdogan's policies of like naturalization and southern citizenship, like Syrians voting in the elections. And yeah, like yeah, so, so Turkey's, it's come up, um, uh, Malta, it's come up in a very big way. Um, ever since the, uh, the program there was first introduced. Cyprus, a little bit in the last elections, although I was in Cyprus in 2018 when they also had elections, it was completely not an issue. And it only came up a little bit as a political issue because there was a massive corruption scandal that, that um, was exposed. So you find it. But what I found very interesting in doing interviews in the Caribbean is that, you know, I did interviews in, I think, you know, five, five countries or so with, with local people. You know, what do, what do you think about this? And what was interesting in the Caribbean, especially in a case like St. Kitts, which has a very old policy, goes back to the um, independence of the country, um, where 19 out of 20 people I asked said, yeah, we're okay with selling citizenship. What else do we have? We have to import everything. We don't have any natural resources. We've got some tourism. We've got some IFF nodes that gets us off of that. But they would, but politics are, are like, Football, literally there. No, but but the current government is doing a terrible job, and the you know previous government was great, or it'd be the previous government was you know totally corrupt, but the current government is doing it great, you know whatever. So so that's where it would would come up, and you know sometimes you know especially once these programs get established, you'll see it does become a political issue. The the, the opposition party will say we're going to change it, we're going to shut it down, but when they come in, especially the micro state, that's getting you know ten to fifty percent of GDP from it. They never do because they really need the revenue. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of um, symbolic politics or claims making around this, um, but, but Turkey and Malta kind of stand out um, in that. And there's been a little pushback. Jordan has a program that's um, doing, doing, you know, a couple hundred per year right now. Um, and there's been a little bit, but a little bit harder in that. Sure, in terms of how do we stop the revocation of citizenship so that statelessness isn't so pervasive, there is international law that effectively states, right? Um, talk about the geopolitics of citizenship. There is an international kind of regime, law, legal regime that says that it is illegal to strip someone of his or her citizenship if that stripping of the revocation of the citizenship leaves the person stateless. But of course, a lot of countries have not domesticated that international law. But I think a lot of citizens, people in power, you can use that international law, especially if your, your country has sign on to the Convention Against Statelessness to domesticate it, to ensure that, for instance, the UK. There was a case of a young woman, Bangladesh origin, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who, I don't know what's happened with her case, but she's a, a prime example of someone who had allegedly fought for ISIS, and, and the UK was going to strip her of, her of her UK citizenship. But she'd never been to Bangladesh, like had no real connection with Bangladesh. So I think citizens, people on the ground, can use these international laws and the sort of geopolitics of them to use them as nodes of resistance, nodes of activism, nodes of advocacy. But there are laws that state you, you can't leave someone stateless by re revoking their citizenship. Thanks. I mean, on Shamim and Bogoma, it's really interesting that they were like, oh yeah, so she's been trafficked, but we're going to keep her stateless. I mean, that, I don't even believe that they necessarily think they're making her stateless, because she could be a citizen of Bangladesh. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, how to protect the rights and privileges of, I mean, I think also learning from the world in the sense that there are a whole kind of season of bad ways in which this has happened. Um, when Estonia and Latvia became independent from the Soviet Union, they, you know, there was this kind of alien status that was given to Russian speakers, mm -hmm. like a third of the population um, in both countries. That number has kind of declined, but not significantly. And when Europeanization came, 
it wasn't like they were kind of forced um, to, I don't even like the word naturalized because these are people that have not moved in their lifetime. Well, some of them have not moved in their lifetimes um, across borders. Um, but kind of imagining how it feels to be declared in the state that you're residing that you're an alien. Like, it's very kind of dehumanizing and rejecting and um, not good. Can I just, uh, sorry, just the second question about the, re I, I think I just wanted to respond that I completely agree in the sense that if you look at the kind of peripheries of the European Union, the, the creation of this, you know, like it's amazing, but it also has these spillover effects and kind of being conscious and conscientious of those spillover effects is really important. And at the same time, when there's kind of people in change, like Romanian citizenship in Moldova, it's very much seen in this kind of increasingly peripheralized world system that Moldova is situated in as a kind of Europeanization from within. So like maybe, maybe Moldova will be a part of the EU and it's interesting how um, the Russia's war in Ukraine is kind of making that possibility stronger, but we don't know when that will be and the kind of reduction uncertainty mechanism is like we can become a part of the EU on an individual kind of community level basis. Um, so I think that's also interesting kind of people in change dimension. Thank you. We're down to the last five minutes, so I'm going to take the final two questions, one from my mind, one from here. Um, you don't have to answer all of them, just choose. So please. Uh, so we have a question again from Varad Rajan in Mumbai. Is it the same person? The same person. Sorry. No, no. No, um, no. <laughs> no, 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 I'll have to be fair. Is there another person no, asking no, a question? No, no, then okay, we're going to go. Sorry, no, 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 no. <clears throat> I'm mindful of time. Yes, please. Oh, okay, I'm just waiting for the mic. Um, I work for SRM, we're an independent due diligence provider. Thank you. I had a very similar question to one that was asked, asked before, uh, but I'm interested in how Golden Passports, Dr. Kristen are, uh, Kristen, are playing towards like the local politics of the countries offering those uh, programs, and, and part, particularly in the sense of how they're changing the accountability of governments um, towards, like, you know, between the shift of, is there an, an reference of, a, of accountability changing from, you know, national citizens to people who are being provided these sorts of passports? Um, and also potentially to people who still don't have passports, who like have the ability to purchase these passports, basically. So that's like a new notion of citizenship. Um, and I guess like this is not one cohesive group, but also like in terms of the gateway to people who have those, uh, who are willing to buy those passports, like the agents who are, who are working in this industry. Yeah, just a question of how the sense of accountability is changing. We'll start with Rob or Yeah. Um, so, so it's interesting. And if you're a CRM, a, a SRM, I mean, this is a big due diligence company, and I talk a lot in the in the book about the role of due diligence in these programs and why you know we this came up a little bit in terms of the difference between a passport and citizenship. And here, you know, ended up with this name, the Golden Passport, but it's citizenship. And citizenship is hard to lose. It can be revoked, but it's a much harder to do. It requires a legal process, whereas a passport can be cancelled. That's it. You, you know, you can effectively erase people. So because there's a, a somewhat transparent um, sort of division of labor process, a bureaucratic process, as you were talking about, was that you have it could be very messy. But that's an important part in transforming this from just buying a passport to in some, a legal status that has some sort of durability. What's interesting, though, in thinking about, because the due diligence companies, like, like you were working for, is very, very important for getting that sense of legitimacy that the market needs in order for it to work. The idea that this will have a future longevity, that you won't just cancel all the passports, and that you know people can kind of trust this as a product. Product. So when you were asking about accountability, I was thinking, oh, it's because you know so much rests on companies like yours. But you asked a slightly different question in terms of accountability, you know, as a citizen with duties to, to a country and all that. So people I'm looking at, most of them don't move. But you know, some of these countries you never even have to go in the first place. Don't there. There's some exceptions: Russians and Cyprus. But of course, most Russians in Cyprus aren't necessarily Cypriot citizens, but they were a big, big source of demand. A lot of people getting citizenship in Turkey um, also have a base there. But you know, Caribbean countries, you don't really see it as much. Malta, you don't see it as much. Jordan, you do see it because you get people, long-time stateless people who are, who are successful business people who naturalize. Um, Vanuatu, you don't see people moving there. So sometimes, you know, they don't, might not even be in the country. So in, and in a lot of these countries, yeah, there's a residence requirement to vote. You have to be there at least six months. It doesn't stop governments from flying in the diaspora to vote in elections. <laughs> But, um, but it's a slightly different you know, notion of citizenship that I'm working with. Excellent. So we are exactly on time. 
Um, yes. I was just going to say, Moldova is interesting because it also had citizenship by investment and took it away because of how it blew up in local politics. Especially at the time that the government was like hugely corrupt and it was seen as very much a part of that and the kind of the, the absence of due, due diligence. So it's also interesting about the states that kind of had it for a short moment and kind of took it away because they couldn't kind of convince anybody that it had legitimacy and people were really worried about criminals and oligarchs gaining citizenship. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, each person who online or in um, the room got to ask their one turn of questions. That's why I didn't go to that question. Um, I want to thank our wonderful speakers for such fascinating discussion. I think we could go on. Um, but there are more events coming up this week as part of the LSE Festival. So do take a copy of the program on the way or consult it on our website, on the LSE website at lse.ac.uk slash festival. So thanks again.